Well, it's been a rough several hours across the entire region. Many areas have seen historic and devastating flooding after extremely heavy rains pounded our region. Warnings and emergencies issued one after another. This didn't even look like a roadway. It looked like this was just a river just going down. There's going to be more today. I can tell you that for sure. I, I would say all the counties that's under the flash flood emergency and there are multiple ones will likely issue uh, uh, declarations of emergencies. He said it's coming again and I said we, we don't have no way to go unless we walk. We have thousands without power, nearly 20,000 people without power this morning. My mom was like, we have to leave. And I was like, what's wrong? She was like, the water is getting in the garage. We have to leave. And Buckhorn Elementary School is almost completely underwater at this point. She's yelling at us, we got to move the cars. We got to this, we got to that. There's water, there's water. A lot of folks are going to wake up to a devastating scene uh, this morning. It was just torrential rain and, and he said, um, we are being covered up with water. This is not even close. I mean, we've still got m multiple rounds of rain to go. I have worked here at WYMT for almost 16 years, many of those as a weather forecaster. Uh, mostly on the morning news, but filling in for other spots when needed. I'm originally from Harlan County, have lived in uh, Letcher County for the last eight or so years. I've lived in Appalachia my whole life. This specific house I've lived in for like six or seven years, I think. I'm 70, he will be 71 end of this month, but uh, I've lived here all my life. Passing through this area, you know, I'm sure people would think, what do they see there? But we see peace and comfort. I can sit on my porch and hear quietness. You know, I mean, uh, in, in bigger cities, you know, you hear sirens or, you know, stuff. But I just think uh, uh, just the comfort of being in a small town. I always just want to be home. Like when I go away on trips and go to bigger cities, I just always want to come back to Appalachia because it's just, it's a whole different setting. It's a whole different vibe. Um, I don't think there's a friendlier place than Appalachia. Everybody knew everybody and everybody was family. So, you know, you always had that helping hand. If anybody needed anything, they were right there with you. This place is heaven on earth to me. Uh, we, went, we went to Pine Mountain Overlook over the weekend and I look out and I think, how could anybody not want to be here? So that week in general, we had started warning people as early as probably Sunday, that Sunday before, hey, we're gonna have a lot of rain this week, uh, things can get bad. I know I preach turn around, don't ground, I don't know how many times, uh, that's my soapbox, it, a soapbox issue. Every time we have a possibility for high water, I start preaching that message right off the bat. And we knew things could be bad at some point. We had no idea that it would be no, that bad and nobody if they said we knew it would be that bad, they're lying. Nobody could ever predict that, nobody. I didn't really expect a flood, and when I look back on things, it rained a whole lot, and sometimes you're just so busy you don't realize. But I remember the water building in my driveway, and I have like a step up to get into the house, and I noticed at one point, like, that water's not usually there. Oh, we're gonna have to use the shovel that the water shouldn't be there. And you know, I never realized till after the flood, I was like, the water was building up and we all just didn't realize it. But did I ever think that it would be as bad as it was? No, as long as I had lived where I had lived, we had only flooded one time. And, but it hadn't gotten the house. It just got up in the yard some, but nothing to the magnitude that we woke up that morning. It had been raining a lot. It was about like two or three in the morning. And I stay up late usually because I like to play video games at late hours. Um, and I heard my mom go through the hallway and it was raining pretty hard. I could hear it hitting the roof and I was like, I wonder if something's going on. So I opened the door and my mom was like, we have to leave. And I was like, what's wrong? And she was like, the water is getting in the garage. We have to leave. 
And we decided we were going to try to go out of the holler to see how high the river was getting. You know, we were just curious, being nosy, really. And um, got to the end of our fence, and we couldn't get any further because the rocks and all were washed over in the road. So we had to turn around and come back. And within probably 30 minutes of that, it was coming up over the bank behind the house. And then probably another 30 minutes, it was up here on the porch. And then it just started coming in the house. It was so fast. I was just so tired. I remember waking up and thinking I had heard a noise, but couldn't tell if I had imagined it. And then the next thing I know, I hear just <laughs> banging on the door. My grandpa's answering it. And he's telling me it's my great aunt. And she's yelling at us, we got to move the cars. We got to this, we got to that. There's water, there's water. And I come downstairs and it's just, there's flood water rushing through. My first thought there was, like, I know water's never been that high. I knew immediately when I saw it, this means people are dead. The water shouldn't be here. The alarm went off on the, on the phone. Well, I got up, I thought, I better look. So I went into the bathroom and the water was already, already rushing by the window. And uh, I could hear the house popping and cracking. And I hollered at my husband. I said, we've got, we've got to get up. We've got to get out. I think the best way to describe the way that flooding typically happens is the ground is like a sponge. When the ground gets full, just like a sponge, and can't hold anymore, the water only has one place to go, up and out. Uh, that's typically what happens during the flood. This, where it had been raining for so long, the ground was already so saturated that the water was standing in places and it was almost like, the best way I can describe it, it was a flash flood on the rivers. And that doesn't happen. It doesn't happen like that. So my parents were like scrambling to, to open the garage and get our cars out. And I hadn't seen anything yet because I was trying to like grab like valuables, things to me. Um, I grabbed my computer because it was like the most expensive thing I own and it's kind of irreplaceable. I grabbed that and I went outside to load it in the car and I, the water was like up to my, about midway up my leg. And I was like, oh man. And about one o'clock in the morning, Rose called me and she said, the, the water is up, it's flooding up here. The water is about to come on the porch. And I was like sleep. I mean, was woke up from a dead sleep. And I thought they was joking. I said, oh, it ain't never, it's never, it ain't that high. She said, yes, it is. It's ready to come on the porch. Uh, so uh, uh, then I heard Leticia in the background say, tell dad that the uh, water has washed the garage away and his car has gone down the river. You know, and then I start really waking up then. We had to get out. So we flipped the power on the breaker box and we, we started outside. Well, our door was already, water was up on it and we couldn't get the door open and it took both of us to get the door open. So when we got out, we were gonna to go to the roof, but my husband has bad knees, so we couldn't. So we, we had to wade. And the water was probably, it was probably up to my shoulders. It was just how unexpected everything was. Um, I don't think anybody expected everything to be so bad so fast. It was like you woke up and it was raining and then all of a sudden we had to wade water out of our house to get out. Um, and that was just 30 minutes us trying to pick up a few little things to take with us, like pictures, a few pictures, but we had to wade to get out. We went to the garage to get the cars out and we realized there was a tree in the road. Um, this part of the road was flooded. You couldn't get by. There was a tree right there on that fence um, and we couldn't get out. <laughs> so my dad had to go get a chainsaw and try to cut the tree in half so we could escape. Um, so he got it cut in half and I was like, me and my mom were trying to grab some stuff and load it in the car. And my dad finally got the tree cut and he was like, okay, we have to go now. There's no other, no, more time. We left and by the time I got in the car, the water was up to my knees. The garage, it was probably 10 feet 
up to the top of the garage. It was all all the way up to the gutters in the house. And I watched, I didn't realize the strength of the water, so I watched cars go down uh, in the driveway toward the creek. There was a two-story building. Like, it was crazy. My car was floating to the roof of the house. Uh, I never really realized that water could do that. And then at one point, my husband and John had to go to help a neighbor uh, he was stuck in the water, and I was on the porch with everybody's dogs, and the bridge gave. We had to park on top of a hill up there and just wait. It was pitch black outside, um, and the electricity went out very quickly. Um, so we couldn't see anything. It was pitch black. There wasn't electricity, there wasn't cell service, you could only make emergency calls. I had so many relatives that thought that I was dead because they just seen the news. And of course on the news it was showing the devastation and they couldn't get a hold of anybody. We have been told in Perry County, they, they can't get crews out fast enough to rescue people out of homes. There's so many water rescues ongoing right now that they're having to call out neighboring departments for help. Okay, so that's how dire the situation is, and that's why that flash flood emergency is in effect until 4.30 for several counties, including Perry. When the cell phones and the internet and all communication went out, uh, the last picture I got from staff was the water basically at the bottom of our porch steps. But when you see that, and then the, then the service cuts out, and you're also trying to keep it together because you're scared for your family, but you've got thousands of people who are watching you. Not only here, I found out later, they were watching us on Facebook and on the live stream from across the country. Um, so when you've got that many eyes on you, you have to keep it together. Look at that water just pouring out of there. This is a house on a hill on Highland Avenue, uh, the Turner house here, and look at that. Look at that raging water. And, just and it's still pouring. Exactly, I mean, it's still pouring up there. So I mean, it's just, this situation is, is, it's bad. We couldn't go into Awesome, which is what's well, the way out. We couldn't go that way. We couldn't go up the mountain to get into town because it was underwater. Um, so we just had to wait. Um, and it was rough, like, we were, we didn't have the radio, the radio went out the the cell phone towers went out there was no electricity we were just in the dark the last thing i did before the cell service went out was i texted my best friend and i was like i don't know if i'm going to get out of this but i love you um because I did think that we were going to die. I thought the water would get up on the hill and that we would die. Um. Yeah, we were, we were actually isolated because we had a bridge up the road that was actually covered with water. And then we had the bridge there where we were that actually led out of, of Mac Roberts. So we were actually isolated. And then the people in Mac Roberts couldn't get out either because the Dunham Bridge was broke also, so we were all just stuck there together. It was just kind of like, by that point, it had calmed down a lot, but also we were still kind of like in disbelief. Um, so we were just kind of standing there watching the house and trying to see if the water was going down or not. You know, we take an issues and answers with the weather service about a week or so after the flood. And I said during that taping that Steve Hensley asked me, he said, do you think this or the tornadoes were worse? And I said, I think the tornadoes were worse. But that was a week later. I didn't have really time to digest it. I'm pretty sure now, no, no, I am sure now, this is the worst natural disaster I've ever covered in my career. We knew we wouldn't have the total impact until daylight broke. And then when daylight broke, that's when we realized how bad it was. Oh my God. <gasps> is that my porch? Whose porch is that? It's Mikey's in my backyard. Yeah. Oh my God. Oh my God. Look at their garage. so much damage.
still unbelievable. Of course, at this point, it's all over the news. It's everywhere. So there's no denying this it really happened, you know, because I think the night of the flood, I went to bed thinking like, did this really happen, you know? And then to wake up the next day and it's still all a buzz. It's like, wow, this it started to set in the realness of it. Depending on where you are, it was a little bit different, but the official estimate from the weather service was six to 16 inches. So I know Whitesburg, the Kentucky River, Whitesburg broke its record crest. Jackson broke its record crest. Um, I don't think Hazard did. Um, who else? Uh, Boonville broke their record crest on the Kentucky River. Um, certain places on the Cumberland River broke their crest. A record crest. So, I mean, it was just something that uh, that had never been seen here before. The morning of, we were still on top of the hill, and we, like, our neighbor was still on the fence. And by now, people that had come from work that worked at night were coming and trying to get across. Um, our neighbor who lives in Buck Creek was like a hauler way down there. Um, he was like, well, I have to get home. I have to go see my daughter and my wife are down there in Buck Creek, which was also like really heavily affected. Um, but he like tried to rescue our neighbor. They formed like a human chain basically to rescue our neighbor. More open up, you know, like I came in through Pikeville and when I got to Jenkins, everything was fine. And then when I left Jenkins on 805, coming through the time I got to Haman, then I could see the, you know, devastation. The bridges were uh, still, you, they were passable, but then the more, the closer you got to Haman, you could see the water, I mean, it had washed houses away and uh, all this stuff, and there's a lot of dust and sand in the road. So when I got to Neon Junction, uh, you know, at the BP, it was uh, that was okay. But from there on up, I mean, it's just like a, like you said, like a war zone. It was dust and dirt and cars up on porches, and it, it was just, uh, you know, I just couldn't really believe. I mean, I could believe it, but it just, it's like something out of a horror movie, you know. But when I got up in the middle of Neon, you know, I thought this place would never be, the, you know, it'd never be the same. I don't think it really sunk in until after I came back a few weeks after the flood. Because in my mind and memory, I know what it looked like before the waters destroyed things. And to be driving down the road, especially going through Jackson, there were trailers just knocked across into other like rivers and ridges. Some spots that were empty and you would think nothing had ever been there, but there was a whole house there. We've had floods as long as I can remember. Even when I was a kid, I'm almost 40 years old and I can remember even all the way back a long time, this area's always had floods. That's our biggest natural disaster. When I go out and talk to school kids, I always preach flood safety. And we've had areas in this one, last one, had never flooded. They weren't even in the floodplain. It was just mud. Um, and it was barren. By the time I got here, like my mom and my family had sort of torn everything out, like all the furniture from my room. And like, um, it's just everything was empty. And what was there was just mud. It, it was a blur, but you still remember things. You remember how tired you were, and you felt like you had to save everything. You know, you didn't have anything, and you wanted to save what you could. And you probably saved things that you probably shouldn't. The smells in the house were so strong, it would take your breath. You had to wear a mask. Uh, sometimes one wasn't enough, sometimes you had to use two. And when you left that day, you had mud boots on. Uh, your your feet were hurting, they were blistered, uh, and you had to take a bath. Probably you had to wash more than one, two times to try to get it all off of you. And then you had to start it all over the next day. We didn't have any clothes because all of our clothes were muddy and nasty and um, 
So it was just really miserable is what I would say. I mean, to hear how much mud was in the house after the water had left and um, knowing that they had to shovel all that out first. Because once I got here, you know, a lot of um, stuff had been removed, but you could see the floors, the walls, that stuff was still affected. So I saw my dad cutting out drywall, you know, basically from the time he got up to the time he laid down, he was doing something. And they started cutting it out and um, then you could see what was behind there. So mold was growing, you know, we didn't know this, but this is, these are all things that we're learning, you know, while it's happening. So we're finding out, you know, yeah, you gotta cut out the drywall. You gotta go a little bit higher. And then, cause not only is it the drywall, but the insulation and then the right. floors, um, the sub floors, you know, it was just like, wow, you're basically putting a house back together from scratch, essentially. There was mud everywhere. And, you know, we had to try to find a place to live and we were gonna stay in the tent because we didn't have anywhere else to go. And my niece gave us a camper to stay in. So uh, we set up in that camper. And then since then, it's been a matter of trying to clean and figure out what we were gonna do. But the community's been awesome. Um, so many people have helped. I'm gonna cry. Um, they helped us all so much. It was a, um, a heart-wrenching time, but you know, I, I always go back to the Mr. Rogers quote and his mom always told him to look for the volunteers and look for the good people. And, and that's what you see, especially, you know, I can't say what I would see if I was in Fayette County or if I was in, but I know what I saw what, being in Letcher County and it was neighbors taking care of neighbors. If you're a human being, it's going to affect you. Uh, but when it's people you know, it makes it that much more personal. And yeah, I, some days, I feel the weight because especially if it's Harlan County where I grew up or Letcher County, my adopted home now, or you know, any other Perry County, I've lived in Perry County for a long time, any other counties that I know people in, I think I think it makes it more personal, it makes it more, you know, and it, it, it makes us strive to get it right. When people heard about Letcher County being hit the way they were, People come out of, I won't say out of the woodworks to help out, you know. The guys would come here and they work like it was their house, you know. They took extra good care of doing whatever they were doing at the house. And, you know, I'm thinking, you know, if this had been New York, how would the response be? You know what I'm saying? Big, different places. But in a small town, USA, I believe it, it was uh, a message, you know, that, there's good people. I was always used to helping everybody. And uh, I remember going up to the LCC and I was like, let me carry that. And they're like, no, Mona, we're here for you this time. And I was like, but I want to help you. And it was really hard for me because I couldn't help anybody. You know, uh, I couldn't help my in-laws. I couldn't help the person down the road because I had helped myself. Uh, and that's the first time I had ever been in that situation to where I could really physically and mentally couldn't help anybody else. You know, we could have done something. We were without water for 28 days. We were without electricity. Well, you can't go in and clean a house up that when you don't even have water to. So we just used that time because we knew we couldn't do anything up there. We just used that time to try to go out and serve, you know, people. And, you know, we worked with Mercy Chefs and um, delivered meals and um, we worked with ICANN and um, so we, just used our time to do other things besides worry about what was going on up there. And, and I think that's the common thread amongst us, you know, mountain people, so to speak, um, that we're we're just resilient and we just, we had no other choice but to keep on pushing. Go clean again. <laughs> uh, we're, we're survivors, so uh, that's, a, you know, an important thing is that, you know, we can, we're like the Timex watch. We can take a lick and <laughs> keep on ticking, you know I mean? And I, I just thank the Lord for that, that we're able to, you know, be able to, to be a survivor. It was truly a blessing of, to have so many people offer help because I remember it's hot Kentucky summer and my mom, my dad, and myself were just bagging up stuff. You know, everything that had been touched basically had to go. Um, 
and we were bagging it up, moving it to the front porch or to the yard because it had to go across the road for it to be picked up. And I remember thinking, oh my gosh, this is so much like we, this is going to take us till the end of August, you know, if it's just us three. And then literally the truck rolled up and it was like, the Calvary has arrived. Um, at first we had a lot of hope. There was so much hope. There was too much hope, almost. Um, we had so much, so many people stop and like give us cleaning supplies. We still have cleaning supplies from the flood. That's how much we had. It was, at, the help was, it, it was amazing. Uh, never did we ever not have a hot meal. Uh, we go to Muck and we would have pizza, hot dogs, cold pop, a drink of water. Um, uh, Jason Hogg actually brought us a whole truckload of water. And I was like, no, I got a couple cases. And he said, no, you're getting a whole truckload, Mona. Um, you know, it was just so much help. And then Rubicon came in and they mucked our house and they are a wonderful group. They were so uplifting and just so positive. It was just like, I just can't describe how wonderful they really were. And uh, I had told one of them, he was from Canada, and I said, I just want you to know how much a difference you've made in my life. So uh, my wings, I call them the kindness wings. Um, I actually wanted to do those before the flood uh, for my sister that had passed away. So afterwards, I was like, I got a hold of the mayor, and I said, I want to paint some wings. I said, I want it to be the kindest wings. Um, I want to brighten up the town. I want to repay everybody for the kindness that I was gay. So that's what went into the wings. Um, and nobody commissioned me. I commissioned myself. It was just something I wanted to do to repay everybody. I didn't cry too bad, guys. <laughs> I'm a soft <laughs> and learned through this process that there's an immediate, there's like a phase of people coming in to help with emergency relief, which that is getting people out of the danger zone, that is getting food, that is getting immediate shelter. Then the next phase is the part that most people don't actually help with, which is the rebuilding. And that's the thing people need the most help with. Figuring out is their house safe to stay in, even if it's not been condemned and what work can they do on it how are they getting the money to do that work? I saw some very, there was, I mean, there was things that I saw that were amazing. And I do not know what um, this county would have done had it not been for um, outside people. Um, my, my, my complaint, my um, frustration lies with um, government. And um, we are a year out on this thing and um, we should be further along than what we are. Everybody's like, okay, a year has passed, the flood is over. It's not over because everything is still in ruin. There's flood debris everywhere. And I feel like if there was another heavy rain here, we are not prepared for it. And we are at greater risk of losing more lives if another flood comes. Um, there's a housing problem. There was a housing crisis before. Now it's even bigger because there's no places to live. Um, a lot of people moved when their houses got destroyed because they couldn't afford to fix them. Um, so I think there was a lot of help at the start, but not now. Um, and I think we need more help now than we ever did. You know, this, I feel like that the state and federal government look at our area like, they do, what do they have to offer? So why do we want to invest money? And I made a comment, nothing would make them more happier than to see our area underwater and not even have to. Now they didn't think that when all the coal severance money was coming in, they loved that, you know, they were all for, but you know, we just, uh, I feel like that that's what we're, how we're looked at now. County-wise, we have so many bridges and roads that got just 
blown away, basically. And if they weren't, they've got these giant holes or dips in them. I remember a volunteer saying, we're not actually ever going to be able to recover all of those. So it's going to be years or decades out, we're still going to feel the impact of this. And I think that's the part that people don't understand or see unless they're here or have somebody that lives here. I think it's going to be a year thing. I don't think it's or years long thing. I don't think it's going to be like, oh, six months, a year, we're done. I think it's going to be years before we can even think about uh, getting back to somewhat semi-normal. I mean, we did it in just a couple of months at my house, but I mean, we didn't have much damage. So, I mean, you think about people, and I have drove by, I, let's take Neon, for example. Neon was basically almost wiped out. Um, and they were already, their infrastructure had already been crumbling for years anyway. So now what happens? You know, where, who rebuilds? Who comes back? Does it just turn into a ghost town? Uh, that's a situation I think you have to look at. But I, I, again, these communities that were already in bad shape before the flood, what are they going to do now? Because it's changed literally the landscape of their town. And I know the good folks over in Neon are doing everything they can to save their town, and all these communities across the mountains are doing the same, but can they be saved? When you send people in here, or when you let people make decisions um, for this area who are not familiar with that, this area, you get what we got. And that was um, um, the um, emergency access roads that were built with um, culverts and gravel. FEMA told um, us that um, you either take this or you don't. This is the plan that we have for you all. And the, and our county judge expressed his concern and said, you know, these are not gonna hold up, but they said, this is what you got. I don't think FEMA could have helped us the best that they could because they just, like the, the geography around here is like, you need culverts and, and things to navigate the creeks. And like, um, the haulers are really a certain way. They didn't know how to navigate around mountains and stuff, I don't think. So um, a lot of what they put in place kind of failed is, and is still failing. Um, it was like a temporary fix, um, not a permanent one. So I think we need more permanent solutions um, and we need funds to put those in. And this summer, we have had more stalled out cold fronts or stalled out fronts in general across our region than I have seen in a long, long time, maybe ever. Uh, in my time here at WYMT. Uh, and events like this, a one in 1,000 year flood, take all the help we can get. It doesn't, it has never flooded here like it, like it has that day. Um, and it just seems like the environment around here is changing a lot. Like as I've grown up, I've noticed it's gotten more intense and we've had more weather related um, disasters. So I think it does have a lot to do with climate change. The weather is changing. Nobody can deny that. The weather is changing. We don't, I don't want to sit here and say it's man-made. I don't want to sit here and say that, you know, it's whatever, but it's changing. We know that. And we're having to evolve with it. We're having to evolve with our coverage. We're having to evolve as humans to how we deal with it. Uh, and this year, I think I was reading, and by 2022 this year, there have been more costlier disasters than at points in human history. Yeah, you know, just last weekend we had a lot of storms, so even yesterday it rained some. So when it rains, you get that anxious feeling that it's going to happen again, even though they're not giving it. You still have that in the back of your mind because you didn't think it was going to hit the last time. So, you know, the storms scare you, the water scares you. I've got animals in the house, they still feel it too. I always get scared every time it rains a lot. I look out the window and I'm like, is it gonna get in the yard again? Um, is it gonna happen again? I just feel like it's gonna happen again and nothing can really reassure me about that, so. I know it's hard for people to understand post-traumatic stress unless they've lived through it. But so many people have that right now. I already didn't like storms 
whether it was thunder or lightning or just pouring rain, but now, especially I live in the attic at the house that I'm at, when it starts to pour the rain and it doesn't stop after a while, I get so antsy. It used to be before this, I was staying up really late at night and I couldn't figure out why can't I go to sleep? And it's because I started checking the time. I wouldn't go to sleep until around 4 or 5 a.m. When my aunt came banging on the door, it was 3 a.m. So it's like a part of me was still expecting it to just all go wrong again. And the realization that I could have died in my sleep. There were people who did. I told my family the biggest impact that the flood has had for me is just the thought that I don't think I can stay here. And my thing has always been, I want to come home. I want to do work that gives back to the community and the people that I grew up with and that helped me. But I can't live through that again. And the reality is it's not if, it's when. As much as I would like to say, I don't think this will happen again in a long time, it may well. It may well. I, I have been doing this job long enough where I don't ever, especially when it comes to flooding, I don't ever count anything out. And yeah, that was historically a one in 1,000 year flood. Who knows if it won't happen one in 100 years, one in 10 years. A lot of people could argue, you know, just move somewhere else. Just go up on a higher place and, and move there. But they don't understand that we don't have the money to do that. And that the higher places here are own, already owned by people. Um, pretty much housing here is like a rare opportunity. Not even opportunity, it's like luck, you know. Um, you can't move to a higher place. You can't move somewhere else. There are climate disasters everywhere. You know, it's easy to be like, oh, wow, it's devastating. Just move. You need to move somewhere else. But it's like, think about being rooted and grounded in a place. And then overnight, just like that, everything changes. It takes a while to adapt, you know, whether you're going to stay and rebuild, that's a, a big decision or if you're gonna start somewhere else fresh. But I think the comfort that we have of being in this community where we know our neighbors, they know who we are, we look out for one another. Um, I used to jokingly tell people that I was from, uh, my town was like Mayberry, <laughs> you know, it's very small, t you know, everybody knows everybody. Uh, it's home, it's home. When I do get to come back to Neon, or Mac Roberts, I see the people I know. It's just like a reunion for me. I'm like, oh my goodness, I've not seen you in so long. Um, it's just, um, I'm glad I didn't have to move away, way, like most people did, because it's like moving away from your family and not seeing your siblings. And you know, Neon is, it's a place. It's been flooded. We look really bad on the outside, but when you look on the inside, it's a big old heart. <sighs> And everybody's full of love. Uh, you know, strangers will come in, but they just don't realize what it's really about. I personally just am more thankful of the little things in the community, things that I didn't realize were probably big things, you know, but like I said, like the neighbors coming together to help and um, things of that nature are priceless, you know, and so it's been... Um, a lot of life lessons through this flood as well right. mm -hmm. and learning to you know let go you know things you're not ready to let go you gotta you can't keep you know you gotta let things go and just trying to forge ahead on a positive note and not um, um, dwell on just the devastation because it's great and it goes far and wide amongst a lot of people. We actually were very blessed uh, we're more blessed than most uh, we have a house 
Um, um, I have my paint supplies back and uh, I paint every day. I have a desk behind the, the couch in the living room. I was telling Anthony this morning, I said, you know, we were the lucky ones. You know, some people are not as fortunate as we are, not able, you know, to get it back. So I feel very blessed. It's 4 a.m. as I sit on the living room couch, the orange light of the street lamp that sits smack dab in the middle of my property, shining through into this blue room. And I'm wondering, why am I up when it's 4 a.m.? I'm awake because the last time I fell asleep, 4 a.m., my aunt came banging on the door with such urgency. And I opened it to the flowing of water water that was too high. So it's not 4 a.m. It's closer to midnight and I feel such unrest and anger and I couldn't tell you why. And I begin to remember all of the people, all the times that all the media focused on, well at least the people are okay. And it hits me. This unrest that I feel. Some of the people survived. Some are unaccounted for. And some of us have lost everything. And then I begin to ask, what do you do when you lose everything? As I wonder this once again one night on my porch, I'm sitting and once again the light is shining, but this time I notice a spider on the rooftop, slowly descending. And I see, and in a way I hear the word rebuild. Spiders rebuild their webs at a certain time every day over and over, and every time it's messed up, even a little bit through the day, they rebuild this very intricate thing, this this delicate web. Because what do you tell somebody who lost everything that they had seen it washed away and flattened? You can get new clothes, you can move somewhere different, you can have a new house, a new property, but it doesn't change that your home is now condemned that you used to know. It doesn't change that you lost your mom, your dad, your closest friend, maybe your only child. And you've lost everything. You have to find the strength to make everything up again. You can't bring back the people. I'm reminded that I must rebuild a sense of safety so I'm not the watchman staying up. And I continue to think of the descending spider. The itsy bitsy spider went up the water spout. Down came the rain and washed the spider out. Out came the sun and dried up all the rain. And the itsy bitsy spider went up the spout again.